I've been very lucky, really, in my life, extremely lucky, because when I was at school, I came across a book by McDougall, of all people, and one of those very ancient psychologists. And um, I don't know what it would have been like if I'd actually come across something really more recent. But anyway, I read McDougall, and I suddenly thought, well, this is the sort of thing I'd like to do, is to explain things like he was explaining war. You know, they had no fear at all. They explained every big issue. And um, so I thought I'd go and do psychology at university. And to hedge my bets, I did uh, zoology as well. I thought I might go into the biological side, because I was interested in some of the biological reading I'd done at school. Or I might go into psychology. I, I was very fortunate again in that I had the, I soon discovered that psychology was the thing, what, was, what I really wanted to do. And uh, it's very amusing because when you arrive at university, or when you arrived at university in my time, I, I don't know whether it still happens, you'd get some very serious man introducing the course by saying, um, many of you come here because you want to understand people. And then they would say, don't come here, go to English. Or go to some other department where they'll teach you literature. Because this is serious science, you see. We're not in the business of understanding people in that way, you see. That was almost enough to put one off, but of course I had hedged my beds with a sort of scientific side, so I thought, oh gosh, yes, that must be right, that must be exactly for me. I will go, I won't be one of the English lit guys, I'll be one of the people who understand things scientifically. And uh, the other thing that kept me going, I, mean, I was excited about it, so it really doesn't sound, I wasn't really working against anything, real terrible obstacle. but. When I picked up a first-year textbook after McDougall, and I paged through it, I saw it was full of things that one really wanted to know. Enormous number of things, from motivation to social groups to mental illness to all sorts of things. And I thought, uh, this is really exciting. And of course, this is what has attracted students to psychology in huge numbers at all universities for so long. The material is just so fascinating. And anyone who can point to, can promise, or even um, mildly and reticently indicate that they might be able to understand these things is going to draw you, you know. So there I was, and I in, embarked on a course in psychology, with, um, uh, which turned out to be just as interesting as I thought it might be. We had a, a lecturer at, at Witz, chap called Warphemius. And Warphemius was the sort of person who is remembered either with tremendous appreciation or with uh, a certain amount of resentment. He was, a, he was an extraordinary person because there was this class at first year students of, I don't know what it was, 250 or whatever. And Warf never seemed to he never seemed to prepare his lecturers. He would come in and he would start talking and he would get other people talking and the whole class would sometimes engage in this and it was pretty disordered, as you can imagine. But there was always a sort of basic text that he'd said, read this, and we would talk about it. And if you, you know, if the conversation went another way. Now, I love this, and, but I've met other students who said, um, God, what a waste of time Old Wolf was, you know. But I thought, thought it was wonderful. So this kind of, um, it really interested me more, um, um, very much more than the more orderly lectures of other people in the department. I mean, um, we had a Professor McCrone, who later on became principal at Witz, and who's very ordered and um, but and very thorough, and I'm sure very systematic, and I'm I'm sure I owe an enormous amount to him. But uh, it was war females who really uh, lit the fire as well. So you never know. You know, people tell you how to teach, but uh, they never tell you. Uh, thank heavens, there's no one way. Let's say that'll that'll be appreciated by every student. Uh, 
some people want the very ordered, very systematic approach, and it's tremendously valued. And, and I suppose the, the thing about Witz was we had both. That was doing different areas and different fields and so on. So um, that I, I then left taught for a while, at school for a while. I wasn't sure that I wanted to go on, but eventually I did. I got a chance at UCT to continue. And at UCT as well, there were quite extraordinary uh, psychologists at the time. There was a, a chap called um, uh, J.G. Taylor, James Taylor, who wrote an absolutely remarkable book, uh, The Behavioral Basis of Perception. Now, Taylor was the first person to make me see what a psychological theory might look like. That is a theory that was precisely stated and started with very clear assumptions and very clear axioms. And he based his work on the uh, theories of a chap um, who wrote um, a book on <clears throat> uh, how, to, how to design, the book was called Design for a Brain. And design for the brain, for a brain, was one of the very early attempts to devise an intelligent machine. And this seemed the way to go. It seemed that if we want to understand how the brain works, we could either plunge our hands into the sort of messy biology and then try to think, well, what is this bit of mess about and what's that piece of mess about? Or we could say, our theory is so-and-so, and we're going to test it by building a machine that will actually be able to perform the functions we're interested in. And that, of course, as we can see now, became an enormously powerful stream in psychology. Um, the, uh, in fact, there were, you know, at places like MIT and so on, the uh, Center for Cognitive Psychology, the Center for Machine Intelligence, all these things developed out of it. And of course you can see the appeal of it. That is, if you have a theory, build it. And uh, so this, it was thought that for a long time, and may still be thought in some quarters, I don't know, that this was going to eventually lead to the construction of minds. Now, we know this has failed. We know that nobody has ever created a mind. You can build a machine that can do many intelligent things like play chess and so on, and, um, but there's no indication whatsoever that they have any minds at all. And we can't really uh, imagine even what would transform this into a mind creature. And this is still, it's still a very powerful uh, sort of stream in psychology. Uh, but I think the, the, the aims the, the, uh, are a little bit more, uh, let's say, the, they're a little bit more restrained, uh, a little less hopeful that one day this thing you will have built will suddenly turn around to you and say, my name is Fanamara, <laughs> who are you? <laughs> or whatever, you know or you're not looking well today. I mean, that's possible. That could still happen because they are sort of, uh, you can program a lot of this in and it might ask if you press the right button or it happens to come across this uh, in the right frame, is, is used to uh, making sympathetic remarks like, how are you today? And did you feel that way when you got up in the morning or that sort of thing? And you suddenly find yourself blubbing and confessing to the animal. But you don't really, I mean, on cold reflection, you don't really believe this is a conscious animal. So there's, mind still remains the, from that point of view, the total mystery to, uh, uh, at the, at the, uh, beyond the reach of all these, these particular attempts. But nevertheless,